Davey D hanging out with you this afternoon. We're in New York City, and we are talking to somebody, an unsung heroine. But when we talk about hip-hop, we know the story of Cool Herc. But there is always a woman that stands alongside and usually behind holding up the man that is uh, taking credit or getting the bows and accolades. And we wanted to talk to the first woman of hip-hop, Cindy Campbell, the sister of Cool Herc. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm here at uh, Martha D. Has H2, uh, H2A Association. It's the Hip Hop International Film Festival, and I'm here, I'm here to support it along with plenty of other people. Now, you're going to be honored, um, you know, uh, for your contributions to helping start this culture. How do you feel about that, and after all these years? Well, I feel great about to see the way hip hop has evolved to the way it is today, and. Um, it's always a work in progress, and I'm always here 100% behind it to help whoever I can, and I see hip-hop just going um, in a positive way. Now, we all always heard the story about Herc doing that first party at 1520 Cedric Avenue, and um, you were the person that put this thing together. Let's talk about it. We've always heard Herc's perspective. Let's hear your perspective of how that party, that infamous party back in 1973 came about. Oh, 74 came about. Oh, Davey, it was 73. Oh, we're 73. <laughs> oh, no, you know, I'm thinking the Universal Zulu Nation, 74. Oh, okay. Right, but talk about the set, that party. Well, talk about the dates when it started and how it went about. Okay, that came about because I wanted to get some back-to-school clothes, and I was working at the time for the Neighborhood Youth Corps, and the money that we were getting paid wasn't enough, so I had to think of a way, how can I increase my money? And I saw a way to do it by having a, a party in the recreation room at 1520 Cedric Avenue and um, I went down to ask about it it was only $25 to rent the room but my father had to uh, sign for it which he did so that's my money being put together but how old were you at that time well Davey I want to let you know I was no 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 no, no. I I was a teenager (laughs) okay okay that's how you do it okay (laughs) we were all teenagers at at that time so it came up and Herc had a sound system but all that equipment was in his room because he used to work with my father because my father used to play for different events for his friends you know and other people so I, I'm thinking, how can I cut my course? Because I have to have the music. That's the main thing when you have your party. you got to have the music. So I said, well, it'll be free because I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so this infamous party, the first hip-hop party, was to cut course? Is that, is that how Hurt got to start? I, I was cutting course. The invitations were done on index cards that I got from school because I was in the student body uh, team. It's, uh, the beverages, I, I bought wholesale mm-hmm. at the wholesale beverage place. We bought a uh, uh, different variety of beverages. We had um, Old English 800 and Coke 45. And believe it or not, David, that set the trend for the hip hop drink. That's what we sold there. Were you sold Old English 800 and Coke 45? Because As those, teenagers, because that, that was the strongest liquor out there. Smart liquor, so we were thinking away. <laughs> wow. But you know what? It was supervised. That's the thing about hip hop. Hip hop was done all on love. It was supervised. Our parents were there. We always use a buddy system. When people left, they left, you know, as a group. Nobody left by themselves. When people came there, everybody was, um, it was supervised. You couldn't get out of hand. If anybody wanted to do anything wrong, they knew they had to leave and go down the street. They couldn't do it there. So it was family oriented. And then hip hop, it, it came out of love. And, and your brother at that time, you was an athlete, so they didn't really want to mess up with him anyway. No. <laughs> so do you remember that first party, the records that he played, or what it was like, you know, I mean, what was your fondest memories of that day? Wow, August. August, wait. August 11th. August 11th, 1973. 1973. Okay. So, and you know what I did also? Well, basically the party was for my friends, but if, and if we really didn't know you, then you had to pay, but so many people came because we charged 25 cents for um, ladies and 50 cents for fellas. We paid about $500 between the door and selling the hot dogs right. and the sodas, so 
it, you know, it, it was it was successful. Successful. Do you remember the songs that were played that night or that day? I can't think of offhand. What I do remember is when we gave the parties, one of the things that we did, and they don't do it now, we had a, a slow jam session. You oh. know? So, it, <laughs> so I went out and I bought some slow songs for my friends because, you know, there were fellas coming there that my friends like or, or, or I like. So this was an opportunity <laughs> to have the slow song to dance with somebody. You know, and I miss that in the clubs. Nowadays, they don't play that. And it just takes away from people kind of getting to know each other a little better, you know? Right, right. So they, they should have those songs in the club. Now, you know, over the years, you've uh, managed your brother's career. You've uh, cut a lot of deals for him. Um, and I don't know, did you set up any other parties for him, you know, at that time? I mean, talk about some of the deals that behind the scenes you were responsible for making sure, you know, your brother got, you know, his just due. Oh, um, you mean as far as the party back then or just things in general? Just in general. Just, yeah, well, one, well, one of the big things I did was I set up the movie deal with him in Beach Street. With Harry Belafonte, uh, Stan Layton, director, and also David Picker, which is a co-producer of Mid My Cowboy. And I was in the office by myself with all these big shots from Hollywood and also Harry's secretary at the time. And the part that they wanted her to play when I looked at the script was a negative part. And really? I had them change it. And Beat Street, what did they want him to do initially? Well, the part he was supposed to play, how it's um, how the kid got his break was actually Ruby. Ruby, Ruby Dinazi Davis' son, Guy Davis, played that part in the movie. He was supposed to get his big break because Kirk was supposed to be a well-known DJ, but he had his hands busted on a windowsill and he was very sulking and he couldn't play. So this is how he got his big break to play at the club. When I saw this, I told Mr. Belafonte, I said, Harry, my brother can't play this part because Kirk is a positive person. He's always helping people. He'll put people before him and he He's, he's done. He still just does that today. So they said, okay, you know, okay, Cindy, we'll change it for you. And we want you to look it over. And when you, if you're happy with it, we'll go with it. And when all that was done, Harry said to me, he goes, um, Cindy, are you a, 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 a lawyer? And I said, no, I'm not, Mr. Belafonte. He goes, well, you're dealing with Hollywood right now. I suggest you go out and get an attorney. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> right, and we did. He did. So he was very helpful in that sense. But I, that's one of, you know, one of many things that I helped my brother with. Right. I remember the, the famous source cover and one of the rare pictures where Flash, Herc, and Bam, the triumphant of hip-hop pioneers, are shown on the cover. So you, you brokered that deal, huh? I, I, I brokered that deal with John Schechter at the time. And he just wanted Herc to do an interview. And when he called me and we were started talking, I said, why don't we do a cover story? And, and that's how the idea came about. He goes, well, Cindy, if you can get all those three guys together, we can do it. And I said, and they also have to get paid for it. <laughs> so you told them they had to get paid. Yeah. And he so said, they had to pay to do that cover. He said, he said, you know, we usually don't pay people to be in the cover. I said, well, these are not ordinary people. You know, you have to give them something. And I still have the contract where they all, where they, you know, every, they all signed it. And um, it was done. I called Flash. I called Bam. I knew Herc was going to be there. Got it together. And that's uh, that was history right there. Right, and you know, of course, with the book, uh, where people really got some insight into Cool Herc and a little bit of your family because they talked to your dad. Um, can't stop, won't stop with Jeff Chang. What was that like, and, and how how do you feel um, uh, Herc's legacy and your family's legacy with hip hop and all that has been, you know, presented? Well, he didn't talk to my dad. My dad passed away um, a few years now. God rest his soul. I still think of him today. But um, yes, we did talk about him in the book. Oh, you never okay. leave them out. Okay. And I I know and I do hope my family's legacy will be uh, you know, and it's looked at in a positive way and that history will recognize it because right now I have a non-for-profit organization. It's called Hip Hop Preserve. And what we're going to do is we're going to preserve the origins of hip hop. We don't want that to get lost or get missing because people don't know the origin of it, how it started. How it started in the beginning from love. It flew below the radar. And if hip hop didn't fly below the radar, it wouldn't have evolved to where it is today. They would have stopped it. It wasn't done from out of um, drugs or, or gang related. Um, the money that we put into it was money that we made ourselves and earned. Whenever, whatever money we made at the door, 
we put that back into the party. Her could put that back into the equipment. Uh, we weren't out there buying clothes or jewelry to be flashy, but that's not what it was about. We were given the community, we're giving people something, we're giving people a culture. When the parties got too big for the recreation, when we had to find a larger space, when the weather started getting cold, we had to go out there and find place for, 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 for our crowd. And people don't realize that. And, and we didn't give parties just to give a party. We gave a party for a reason. We gave a party for a reason. And what was the main reason? Well, um, people will say, you know, Herc, you know, what's coming up? Um, you know, you haven't given a party in a while. And we said, okay, the streets are telling us to give a party. And, for instance, we always gave something for um, a Thanksgiving party or maybe for a New Year's Eve party, Christmas party. We gave that to people so people didn't have to go downtown. A lot of people couldn't afford or have the money to go downtown. And one of the reasons why um, we had the parties because people, we just wore your sneakers and your jeans. And that set the trend for hip-hop. That's the whole thing. Because don't dress enough to try to get in the club. No, just come as yourself. And that's what we're doing today. That's it. Be comfortable. And that's what hip-hop is.